On today's show, the San Diego Padres finally make a free agency acquisition in the form of Brad Miller. What that says about the team going forward, as well as talking about Xander Bogarts' transition to second base and whether or not, low-key, he could already be one of the best players in MLB at that position. You are Locked On Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Lockdown Padres Podcast, which is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day for Wednesday, March 6th. As always, I am your host with sometimes occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You can find my baseball-related work over at Just Baseball. You might be familiar with my work over there, writing about the Padres and all of general baseball and whatnot. You might also be familiar with my entertainment work. You can also find that at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O on Twitter, or at L-O underscore Padres. If you only want Padres content, don't worry. I'll whip that up for you, too, over at Locked On Padres. And on this here podcast, obviously... And today's podcast, guys, is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash lockdown MLB and use code all lowercase, all lowercase, lockdown MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Today's gonna be a fun little one, guys. We're talking about Brad Miller and we're talking about Xander Bogarts because I am obnoxious, so I want to talk about Bogarts and how, once again, I do not understand totally why everybody's super, super down on him. Um, but you know, you know, we're, we're going to do it anyway. We're going to, we're going to combat the naysayers and also we're going to talk about Brad Miller and we're going to start with that. Yesterday it was announced that the San Diego Padres had signed Brad Miller to a minor league contract, basically that, um, how, how do I put this? Uh, a minor league contract with the Padres that includes an invitation to spring training, um, reported by AJ Katzvel first yesterday. Um, so here's the thing. I know that it's not exactly the, the th- most thrilling uh, siding considering, uh, you know, just from what I feel like from the, from my perspective, it seems like everyone's like, all right, Tommy Pham and Michael A. Taylor. And I like how there's been kind of the new free agent of the week. It feels like when you follow Padres reporting, whatnot, where it's, it goes from being, there's a storyline every week and then it quickly goes away and we get another one. I E it was once upon a time. It was all right. Is Jackson real going to make the opening day roster? D- definitely. It sounds like it. And for the record, I honestly heard about this beforehand, but it sounds like now it's very close to happening, especially with Tatis getting giving him the endorsement. Um, you had that as a storyline. Then you had the storyline of, okay, which free agent outfielder are they going to sign? Okay, which free agent starting pitcher are they going to sign? Okay, wait, wait. Uh, they're going to sign Tommy Pham, all right? Like, there's there, it just goes back and forth all the time. And then I think it's really funny that Brad Miller, of all people, is the one that gets signed over. And it's really funnier for two reasons. One, this is once again AJ Preller um, tapping into his Texas Rangers roots. Um, now don't get me wrong, Brad Miller wasn't like he's not totally like a, a Rangers player. But what I'm saying is that it's just funny that like all anyone who's gone through the Texas organization at one point, especially recently, as the case with Brad Miller, AJ Preller seems to be interested. I I just find it really funny. I think it's cute that he's like always going back to his old stopping grounds. It's like he has connections there, and they tell him what they think of certain players. And number two. I actually, longtime listeners might remember, I advocated for the Padres signing Brad Miller a few years ago where my thing was, I just thought that he would serve as a really solid bench piece um, because of his utility. And that's kind of the situation here. Now, it is a minor league situation, so that doesn't mean that he's going to make his, you know, any type of appearance with the team. This could be a Runet Odor situation where, you know, they bring in Runet Odor and they're like, all right, this guy's just going to play for us for a little bit. Maybe the bat starts off hot. Maybe he actually plays well at the beginning. And then when it falters off, if it falters off, likely, um, then we're ready to bring up maybe some of our other players, like your Grand Paulies, like your Jacob Marcis, like your, hey, maybe they'll clear spot for, no, they're not going to do Salas. But you get my point. Like all the many prospects that the Padres have, maybe that's what this is. Um, that's could, That could be what it is. Maybe if he balls out in spring training. He's been an effective offensive player before. Um, the p- problem is that the past two years with the Rangers, he hasn't. 87 WRC plus in 2023, 66 
in 2022. Now, granted, he did not play a lot in both of those two seasons because, I don't know if you guys knew this, the Rangers are pretty stacked, so they don't really need Brad Miller. You know what I mean? Whether it be from Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager to guys like Evan Carter making their debut, the fact that Adolis Garcia was a really big deal for them, um, Nathaniel Lowe uh, really broke out in a big way for them. Not going to lie, I was a little bit surprised by that. Um, so basically what I'm, what I'm getting at is, in fairness, he didn't have a lot of playing time. He played 81 games in 2022 and only 27 last year. He's 33 years old, going to be 34 this year. And his last like true full season with Philly, he was actually okay. He had 227 average, 321 on base, 453 slugging. So he didn't hit for a decent amount of power, 20 home runs, and a 106 WRC+. plus. He's not a good defender, which is his problem, but he does bring positional diversity. Or uh, not diversity. Wrong word, my bad. Don't don't attack me. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Aggregators don't take this. I know people use that as a buzzword. Um, that also, and then the previous years, like in 2020, he had a 121 WRC plus. The year before that, 127. He's had effective seasons before at being this bench role player who can come in and play at a bunch of different positions. Most recently in the outfield. But again, one thing about him doesn't play good defense. This isn't like, say, Kike Hernandez, who got a major league deal, obviously, recently from the Dodgers, where he's struggled offensively too lately, but his defense when he was playing in the outfield or wherever he's been playing, especially center field, he's actually really, really effective. So that's the one downside here. Again, I don't think this is going to be that major of a deal. Um, I think that it might show you, though, that the Padres are kind of like, this looks like it's the team, guys. Um, unless barring something like really weird happens and granted there are still other free agents i mean we still have jordan montgomery who is a postseason hero and blake snell who was the cy young as free agents so nothing would surprise me if like there's still more moves to make but it could be a signal that yeah this is kind of what they're going to roll with we're going to have a zokar we're going to have a mixture of you know paulie and, and marcy and some of their other outfield prospects maybe taking some time out there as well as jackson merrill and then you have jerks and profar it just feels like it's going to be a big cluster of guys over in left field and center field, especially left field, I think. But we'll have to see. We'll have to see. But I don't think that Brad Miller is going to be like a giant player for them. But in theory, I would have liked him. I wouldn't I wouldn't have minded him a couple of years ago. And it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. But I'd keep an eye on him. Maybe it's an Odor situation where he plays a little bit at the start. And then slowly, like, they, you know, incorporate some other guys. Hey, maybe there's some service time thing that might happen here. Maybe they really like Jacob Marcy. But considering all their financial constraints, they're going to be like, all right, we're actually going to bring him up like in a few weeks and then we'll have Brad Miller play for the beginning because at least he has the versatility and whatnot. We'll have Profar out there and and then, you know, we can call them whatever the month is in which you get an extra year. It's not impossible. Now, I will say the Padres haven't done that basically more or less at all. They've actually rushed their prospects, which is something we've talked about before. But given the financial constraints, given the uh, a new a new ownership group and whatnot, not ownership group, but a new face of ownership, I should say, um, given all that. Not impossible. I would just keep my mind open for those type of things going forward. Um, it's just anything can happen in that regard. Although I don't expect a giant change, but I digress, guys. That's basically it for Brad Miller, though. And look, I, I first of all, I'm just impatient. I'm hoping like heck that we finally hear about when the heck Blake Snell is going to sign. I do not think it'll be with the Padres. I think that his average annual salary would be too much, even if it was one of those one-year with opt-outs type of deal. Maybe it's a prove-it deal that he does. He goes the Correa route. He goes the Matt Chapman route, something like that. I just don't see it. And not to mention, it would give them like no flexibility going forward, which is something I keep emphasizing on this podcast is why I don't want to spend big on some players this year because next year's free agent class is deeper. And you don't want to have... See, my computer once again agreeing with me. And you don't want to have... Um, you, you don't want to be limited, basically, is what I'm saying for next year's free agent class. Even if they don't necessarily you don't love players there i just don't think you want to be limited right now i think walker bueller is better than blake snell for example i just don't know we don't know what we're getting out of him this year with the injury but i think he's better than blake snell i think corbin burns is potentially better than blake snell that's already two pitchers i mentioned and there's still a lot of depth guys you could get next year too so i would wait and not freak out you know maybe maybe the problem with the Padres right now with why they can't sign your michael a taylor's or your tommy fams the latter of which, Dennis Lynn actually noted in The Athletic, it could be just that fam wants an extra year and the Padres don't, almost maybe going back to my point, which is they don't want to be tied down heading into next year when they might be more ready and able to spend because they just need to reset their luxury tax. So just a bunch of things to think about from your boy, and that's it. No, no judging if you disagree, though. But if you disagree, let me know in the comments why. I'd love to hear your responses.
But we're not done yet, ladies and gentlemen, obviously. We're going to be talking about Xander Bogarts' transition to second base because that's what we do out here on the Lock On Padres podcast. We talk the big storylines. And I want to talk about how whether or not he might be one of the best players, if not the best, at the position. And I don't think anyone's talking about that for, you know, reasonable reason. It's kind of crazy that they're... 11-year contract that you're already changing him to another position. But even still, let's look at that. But before we look into that, guys, I want to take a second to look into a new sponsor. Ooh, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. It is Prize Picks. Folks, here's the thing. Let me tell you, we love Prize Picks here at the Lockdown Padres Podcast. It is one of the greatest new sponsorships we've had in a long time. And while I am ad reading, it turns out that the image that I was supposed to put at the bottom seems to have glitched out. So I am trying to add it back in right now. I don't know why this happens to me every time I'm doing this show. But nevertheless, guys, I think that Prize Picks is a really cool thing. You might have heard from it before, actually, um, on many other podcasts or many other baseball content creators. It's really great. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. And you can get in. On the excitement with our buddies over at Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. That's right. This this ain't your regular your regular thing. You know, this is separate from FanDuel. It's fantasy, and it's kind of like daily fantasy, basically. Where maybe you don't want to be drafting every day. Maybe you're one of those people who just want to. You know what? I don't want to take the chance at my draft that Fernando Tatis gets drafted and everyone takes before me. You know, well, guess what? You can go day to day. You can go week to week. That's kind of what they do here um, over at Prize Picks. You can play alongside of Prize Picks' favorite players like Meek Mill and Sugar Sean O'Malley. You can find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks communities community each week. There's conference tournaments on there. There's even injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players get injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. So that's really cool. So a little bit less frustration and whatnot. You know, it's really cool. It's really cool. Highlight your winnings from Prize Picks, guys. Go download the app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's right, our new sponsor and a new deal for you. Remember, download the app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match of up to $100. It is highly encouraged for you, my friends, to check this out over at Prize Picks. I'll see you there. And just like that, we are back here, ladies and gentlemen, on the Lockdown Padres podcast. That was a really weird ending to the ad read. My apologies. I think I got nervous. I don't know why I got nervous, but I was like, Oh wait, yeah, wait. I don't, I don't mean to say anything anymore. I don't know what I say here. So uh, everybody, go check out Prize Picks. You might have heard of it before. Really fun fantasy game, basically. You can go check out. Let's check out Xander Bogarts now, in terms of his ability to play second base. Now, I think that there's a lot of different things I want to talk about here. First of all, I want to talk about really quickly what I alluded to before: the transition in terms of 11-year contract and already you're changing his position. The even if Bogarts is everything that I'm about to say, even if it comes true, even if I'm right and my bullishness on Xander Bogarts is validated, AJ Preller, this is really another indictment on AJ Preller, in my opinion, that we're in this situation. Because if you want to look at it from the long term perspective, I'm just from afar, even if this is, you know, not cherry picking, but a little bit of, you know, fitting my argument. They trade their future shortstop, their sports shortstop of the future who's, like, younger than me, and I don't even think he's old enough to drink yet, and C.J. Abrams, and they trade that because you're getting, well, your superstar of the future, Juan Soto. You fail to extend Juan Soto because you then give a huge 11-year contract to another shortstop. It's like, okay, so we lost Abrams, and this is going to be the guy, and then you fail to retain Soto, and then you have Xander Bogarts, who's got an 11-year contract, and then you have Hassan Kim, who was already there and already a gold club caliber shortstop before, uh, as noted in 2022. And he also improved this is with his bat greatly and then improved again last year. So then you respond to that and you sign a big shortstop. And then you trade the guy that you had traded that future shortstop for. Then you sign the big shortstop at Bogarts. And then you are all of a sudden getting all these rumors. And now you want to extend the shortstop that maybe you should have extended in the first place. And it's Hassan Kim. So I'm saying all this to mention that I just think that it emphasizes the fact that they're moving him from short to second, that they just really 
they keep operating on a now basis. And I think that that's admirable in some ways. I really do. I think that in a sport that keeps showing us that there are teams that quite literally will never win because their ownership just does not care. You know what I mean? From your Brewers to your Guardians to your Rays to your, you know, A's certainly, right? That it's still an admirable quality to have that you are aggressive and that you're like, I want to go for now. Let's not just kick the can down the road like these other teams. But to me, it shows not necessarily a lack of... How do I phrase this? It's admirable that you want to go in now, but you're showing that you don't plan ahead much for what happens if you do go in um, all in for now. Because the fact that you trade Abrams, who, yes, I know some guys, some people on this podcast are probably like, CJ Abrams, he, he hasn't been any good. They dodged a bullet. You could make the argument that trading Abrams actually made sense because the Padres are more in a win now situation and they don't want to wait on a 21 year old kid. That's totally possible. I mean, he made his debut when he was 21 with the Padres. I totally get that. But decent defender, and he improved. he's improved greatly. He's actually hitting the ball harder. He's not striking out a lot. He steals a crap ton of bases. 2.1 F4 last year. I'm just saying, like, don't get me wrong, Hassan Kim is a better player, right? Xander Bogarts is a better player. But the fact that you're in this situation where you traded Abrams and now, you know, hey, Jackson Merrill originally was supposed to be, like, the shortstop, right? Like, it just feels like there's been a little bit of a lack of clear like planning ahead because then you sign Bogarts and you're already ready to move him to second base. Usually when you give out a big contract, it's not always the second baseman. Don't get me wrong. Second basemen are good and they're important just like any other position. But shortstop is like the super athlete on the team. The guy who makes the most impact defensively, dare I say, in the entire infield or maybe on the entire field. Potentially. We all know the value of defense. When you look at guys like Francisco Lindor, when you look at guys like, um, Fernando Tatis Jr. the other way um, a few years ago. You know, Angleton Simmons couldn't hit worth a lick, but his defense was so electric that he was a borderline all-star some years. So that's my thing. You usually give those type of contracts to, like, your shortstops of the future and that you're already changing your tune on that isn't the best of vibes. Now, don't get me wrong. I like that if the team and Mike Schilt feel that Bogarts is better served here, that they're not going to hurt the team because they don't want to cop to the fact that eh, maybe we overpaid for a guy that actually was more of a second baseman or we wanted to be our second baseman as opposed to the young guy in Abrams or Hassan Kim, right? So, or maybe even Jackson Merrill potentially later on. But it is true. I will give him a break on the Abrams thing and say, hey, look, you know, maybe he wasn't ready yet. And even if he does have a breakout this season, it's probably not going to be as good as Hassan Kim. If it is... Actually, it's not impossible that he's good as, as good as Hassan Kim this year. I'm really bullish on C.J. Abrams still. Um, but Xander Bogarts, yeah, probably from the batting perspective, Bogarts is better even at his worst, right? But I'm just bringing that up. That being said, let's talk about this move to second base because I actually think that, one, I just love what it says about the team that they are like, you know what, let's do this. If we think this is better, let's do this. Let's not wait around an issue that I think some people had with Bob Melvin last year is that he understandably was like, you know what, I'm just going to trust my superstar, ultimately high-paid superstars, to figure it out. They can't be this bad for an entire year, right? And it didn't happen, but I like that they're making some changes. Xander Bogarts, in terms of his move to second base, first of all, like we've talked about with Hassan Kim, he's had great success over at shortstop before. Not only did he win the Gold Glove last year, he was also a nominee, if I'm not mistaken, in 2022. Um, I don't remember if he was a nominee for sure, but he was also really, really good at shortstop when he did play there in 2022. In 1,000 innings, he had 1,092 innings. He had 10 defensive runs saved and six outs above average. That's better than even Xander Bogarts' last year in Boston where he was a very good defender. Or he had about five defensive runs saved, something like that, five outs above average. Last year, he had three outs above average. So he was solid. He was steady. But Hassan Kim clearly has higher potential upside with the defense. And there also might be some contract behind the scenes chicanery going on where it's better for him to enter free agency as a potential shortstop rather than second baseman. As I've been mentioning earlier with, you know, the market and how that works, right? So that's one thing. And next is, look, Xander Bogart's if we're trying to keep the guy healthy, putting him at a little bit little bit less taxing of a position might be a good idea. And also, it might not just be because Hassan Kim wants to go to shortstop before free agency and he's better there. It might not just be what I just mentioned about how um, they want to keep him healthy. It also might be the fact that Xander Bogarts, if you go by StatCast, his arm strength ranks in the 24th percentile. 
second base, a lot closer to first base. So potentially, I actually wouldn't be surprised because I think that his range is good. I just think that his ability to make certain, like, highlight plays, get the ball out on, like, a quick level and just, you know, like, you know, have the arm strength, I don't think is necessarily a strength of his. No, don't get me wrong. Um, he's still, like I said, he was still an effective shortstop last year, albeit not amazing. Um, Hassan Kim doesn't, doesn't necessarily have like the greatest arm strength in the world, but he was certainly very good at it. 64th percentile on arm strength. So I just think that he could work a lot better there. And he's also just electric to watch. I want to see more from Hassan Kim. Do you, do you, don't you guys like kind of miss watching him play short? Cause he's amazing there. It's like incredible what he does there. Like zipping that ball. Like it's like, he's throwing, you know, uh, a tangerine, you know what I mean? Like it just looks awesome all the time. So shouts to that. I think that Xander Borges with the arm strength stuff. Guys, I wouldn't be surprised if he is one of, if not the best defenders at the entire position outside a couple players like your Nico Horners, like your maybe your Bryson Stotts is a good example. Um, who else is out there? Isn't Tommy Edmond really good, I think, defensively there? Whatever, you get my point. Um, that wouldn't shock me. But speaking of those other players, I want to talk quickly about what other players could be better than Xander Bogarts at second base. And also... How, once again, you shouldn't be giving up on this guy. But before we do that, guys, let me just take a quick second to talk to you about a not super new sponsor, but one we've been talking about more lately, and that's eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. That's what brings home the winning trophy, ladies and gentlemen. And the same can be said for your ride or die. Your motor vehicle, guys. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts. 122 million. That's a lot. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride. It's really intuitive, by the way, too. Their system. Like, it just will give you, like, these check marks and show you what fits for your vehicle. Don't worry about, like, oh, wait, I picked the DX Delta Turbo Wheel instead of the DX12 Delta. Don't worry. They got you covered, ladies and gentlemen. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. Can't take credit for that bar, I have to admit. Shouts to eBay Motors. Y'all cut cable with the killer there. Burning rubber, not cash. Well done. Well done. With all the parts you need at all the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that W. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are back here on the Lockdown Padres podcast, the waning moments talking about Xander Bogarts' potential at second base. And I just wanted to quickly discuss discuss how he might compare it to the rest of the people at the position. First of all, I want to emphasize, and I've talked about this before on the Xander Bogarts pod, but I just want to mention that I really have felt like there's so many people who are just out on Bogarts. And honestly, I think part of it is justified really increasing ground ball rate. The hard hit has fluctuated with years. The wrist injury, the long-term deal, you know, all, all those things. I get it. But my thing is, like, still 4.4 F4 last year, and everybody loves Trey Turner. Am I targeting Trey Turner because he rejected a Padres deal? Maybe. Maybe, maybe just a little bit. Maybe just a little bit. But I'm just saying Trey Turner, oh, well, he blew up in the second half, and he had that great month after the Philly fans didn't boo him for once, and they cheered him. I'm like, okay, he still had a 3.88 F4 last year. He had a he had like an 83, what was it? Like an 83 WRC plus in the first half? Let me see that real quickly. Um an 84 WRC plus in the first half, 140 in the second half. Xander Burgess was 106 or so in the first half, and then 137 in the second half. So I don't understand that this idea that Trey was the only one that blew up in the second half. And also, Trey Turner was horrid defensively last year. Xander Borgarts was like an average, decent, even effective player at times. But last year at short, for Philly, minus 12 defensive runs saved and minus four um, outs above average. Like, what are we doing here? I think the one advantage that people might have had with Trey was that, at the minimum, even as his worst, he was a better defender than Bogarts because Bogarts, up until that last year with Boston, was pretty bad um, defensively. You know, not not always a liability, but not great, right? And then that changed. So I'm like, why is everyone giving him no flack for what happened last year when mostly the Xander Bogarts disappointment was that he was uncharacteristically, uncharacteristically bad with runners in scoring position? 
hitting below 200 and having a 200 BABIP as opposed to the 300 average he had in Boston with the um, runners in scoring position. So that's my issue. I don't understand how people are super down. I think it's because it's fun to make fun of the Padres and how they were that small market team that overcommitted and everyone's like, oh, look, they're broke. I think that's why everyone is down on Padres players. It's easy to be down on Manny Machado for a variety of reasons that trace back to his Baltimore days and then to his brief Dodgers tenure, right? I think that's there. And then Tatis... We know because of the PED thing, right? So I think that people are just down on Padres players because it's a little trendy right now. Maybe I'm being a little bit too tinfoil hat-y, but that's how I feel about it. Um, But in terms of the rest of the position, really quickly, the only other player that you can confidently say is better than Xander Bogarts, and I mean this, is Mookie Betts. And I'm not even trying to be hot takey. Other than that, I genuinely think that Xander Bogarts could have a better season than almost all these guys. Right, Last year, Mookie Betts, 8.3 F4. He's one of the best players in baseball. It's fine. That's not an insult. 39 home runs. He's cracked. Right, like He's been cracked for years, and it's still pathetic that Boston traded him. Marcus Simeon is the next one, where he had 6.3 F4 last year. But remember that he actually was ineffective as well his first year, although not terrible, 4 F4 with the Rangers. And that was because he you know, did a decent job at having a really good second half. Does that remind you of anything? And... Um, what's it called? Being a really good glove. 11 defensive runs saved and 8 outs above average. Now, I will say, I don't think it's likely he's better than Marcus Simeon. I think it's possible that he could be a 6-win player again. I do. But power. I think that's the big issue here. I think that Marcus Simeon just has a lot more power. And if he is still going to be good defensively, even if you translate... Xander Bogarts' his best tenure at shortstop, and then maybe he transitions over this year, and he's an eight defensive run saved, four outs above average second baseman. Maybe that's what he does. Even still, the bat has to maintain the same, and as we talked about, it's not possible, not impossible that you know he has a little bit of a similar slash line to last year. Maybe he's not a 300 hitter necessarily anymore. Even if all that happens, I think Marcus Simeon's power isn't going away. So that's another unlikely player. But after those two, after those two, You've got Nico Horner, you had Hassan Kim last year at second base, you have Ketel Marte, Ozzy Albies, Bryson Stott, Tyro Estrada, Andre Jimenez, Luis Arise, Gleyber Torres, Jeff McNeil, Brandon Jury, Tommy Edwin, Whit Merrifield, Jonathan India, Zach McKinstry. So excluding those last like four or so, let's begin. Jeff McNeil. I'm actually a little bit higher on that guy because he's really weird and he's a little bit of a BABIP kind of guy where you just, some years he'll be great and some years he'll be bad. He's been very back and forth. Um, these past few years, just to emphasize, 131 WRC plus in 2020, then 91 in 2021, then 141 in 2022, and then 100 last year, right? So he's either hitting above 300 or going to win the batting title or nothing. And he is not necessarily a player that is going to be breaking the records when it comes defensively. He's not bad, though, I will say. But last year at second base, negative three defensive runs save, one about out above average. I think Xander Bogarts can be better than that, and I like that he's got certainly at least more power than Jeff McNeil. And again, I really think that his numbers were good last year. It's just that he didn't drive in any runs. And if he had, then I think a lot of people would be viewing this differently. So I think he's better than Jeff McNeil. Gleyber Torres, solid batter, actually. Good walk-to-strikeout ratio as well. 10% walk rate last year, you know, around, uh, let's see what, what we have here. 14.6% strikeout rate, hits for a decent amount of power, especially at the position. 25 home runs last year, 24 the year before. But he doesn't add anything defensively. And I think that Bogarts, I still think he can be a guy that reaches 20 home runs. But, you know, we'll we'll have to see. And I do think that he can be a better defensive player than Glaber Torres, who's almost always been a negative, with the exception of 2022, where he was just, you know, okay. Um, In this past year, negative four defensive runs saved, negative three outs above average. So, again, I think he's better than both of those guys. Moving on even further, um, let's say... Uh, Luis Arise. Luis Arise, he's an incredible hitter, probably better last year than Xander Bogarts was. 132 WRC+. Plus. You know what his problem is? Can't field. And if he was a good fielder, he'd be one of the best players in Major League Baseball. But minus 10 outs above average last year. I think Bogarts is better than Arise. I really do. Bryson Stott. 101 WRC+. Plus. Good defender, but doesn't have the offensive upside, at least for now. It wouldn't surprise me if he gets better, but I think he's better than him. Ozzy Albies? That's a weird one because Ozzy Albies is one of those guys where I feel like sometimes the war doesn't always track what I feel like you see. Really steady player, kind of does the same thing every year, really consistent, hits for power. Not the best defensively though, right? Not the best defensively. And I think that that's the difference between a player like him and Marcus Simeon, 
where he's not great defensively. Minus nine outs above average last year after making strides the year before. Just not a lot of positive going on there. So while I do think that he can be a better bat than Xander Bogarts because of that power and that consistency and the fact that he's still young at age 27, I think that right now and certainly next year, at least for next year, he could be better than Ozzy Albies. Ketel Marte, that guy's really good, but he's a little bit of a question mark with his health sometimes. You know, last year was kind of the first time in a while that he remained fully healthy. And Xander Bogarts is kind of a modicum of health, right? Like, but other than that, if you look at Ketel Marte, a lot of missed games. A lot of missed games in his career, so that's totally possible. Um, and who else we got here? And then Nico Horner. Nico Horner's like the third highest rated second baseman according to F4 on fan graphs. Um, and almost all of that comes from defense. And to me, I don't like guaranteeing that someone who where all of their value is coming from their defense, that that's just going to be a layup and it'll happen again. I think players can fall off defensively. It does happen, um, even if it's for a year at a time. I think it happens. I don't think that it's a lock that the defense stays with you. At least that's just with me. You can be off defensively. 102 WRC plus for him. Still manage a 4.7 F4, but that's why. Steals a whole lot of bases. He's got some nice utility. He's kind of like a little bit of a Hassan Kim um, to an extent, except with not the same hitting ability and more about... Um, you know, more about being just a, a stolen base merchant, dare I say. So, look, I'm just looking at all these players. Andres Jimenez could have a bounce back this year. He was really good a couple years ago with Cleveland. I'm not sleeping on him. But for the most part, I look at this and say, aside from Mookie Betts and Marcus Simeon, I wouldn't guarantee that any of the players I've mentioned could be a better player than Xander Bogarts at second. So while all of it is frustrating that they're kind of transitioning him over to a different position, don't sleep on the fact that at least he could be one of the best players at the position. And there are some other guys that could be interesting down the line, like Jorge Polanco, I think, is being a little bit underrated right now. Nolan Gorman is young for the Cardinals. He can be effective. And Matt McLean last year mostly played shortstop, but I think it's more because Jonathan India is taking up second base for them. But even still, more of a shortstop, at least for now. Those are some other you know young guys. But I'm not necessarily going to look into the young guys right now, like the Jackson Holidays, because we don't know yet. Um, but aside from those guys, are you confident? Right? I'm just saying, I really do think that Xander Bogarts could be one of the best second basemen in baseball. The only one I think that's unimpeachable is Mookie Betts. And I think not 85% sure that Marcus Semien will have a better season. But other than that, you certain about Nico Horner and Ozzy Albies and Cattell Marte? I think Xander Bogarts would be a five and a half win player. It wouldn't shock me at all. It genuinely would not shock me at all if he has that much better of a year. Because look at what he did last year while being so poor as with runners on base, which is something that I don't think transfers year to year. This isn't like the NBA or the NFL, where clutch becomes genuinely a part of the conversation for players. I don't think it becomes part of the conversation for baseball players. But anyway, with that all being said, that about does it, ladies and gentlemen, for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast, the only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. Follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. Feel free to DM me or... Leave comments in the YouTube for questions that I may answer on Monday's show. Um, I definitely love doing that. I take questions up to like Monday morning. And also, who knows? Um, you could also just leave comments. I might talk about them on the show regularly. So do that. It's been a lot of fun interacting with you guys more and more lately, especially. Uh, in terms of the future of the show, might be talking with Paul Holden of Lockdown Rockies about worst case outcomes for both of our teams. Then also might be going over the back end of the Padres rotation, giving my thoughts on guys like Pedro Avila, Jairo Iriarte, Johnny Brito, Randy Vasquez, those type of guys. And then also looking and having some fun. You know what I mean? Looking at not just the opening day lineup, but also some former trade targets and free agents that didn't age well and some that aged really well that the Padres maybe should have went out and got. So going to be doing all that and much more, guys. But until next time, stay safe and, of course, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies, take care.